So I am uh, delighted right now to, uh, to introduce up um, two amazing women of God. So they are going to uh, co-preach this morning. Um, and what I, what I love about these two, about Natalie and Vanessa, is um, like my, my personal relationship with them spans about 30 years. I've known these two for like a total of 30 years. Like these are just amazing women of God. As we were talking the other day and preparing for this moment and we were praying about this moment, one of the things that I told them is we get to do this as family. That these are true sisters of mine. They're not just gifted women, right? These are sisters of mine and these are women that um, are a true blessing to all of us in this house. So uh, I'm so excited to hear what they have to say. I know they carry uh, just a, a, a profound word for this moment. So I think what we're gonna do first is we're gonna have, is it, Natalie's gonna go, okay. So Natalie's gonna go first and then, and then you're gonna play cleanup, okay. all right? <laughs> you're, you're gonna be the closer, you're gonna be the closer. We'll do pitching terms, huh? All right, so give Natalie a hand as she comes Woo! forward. Huh? Wow, just gonna have a moment for a second. <laughs> I am so thankful for this house. You guys have empowered me more than you could even imagine. Today's a little bit of a rough day for me, so. So when I started getting word of what I was going to preach today, I would tell people, oh, I'm going to preach on Leah, and they'd say, who? And I said, exactly. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know Leah, um, you get her story in Genesis at the very end. And she um, is the firstborn daughter of a man named Laban, and Laban is actually the brother of Rebecca, who's married to Isaac. And um, the story starts with Jacob, who is the son of Rebecca and Isaac. And if you remember, he's also the one that stole his brother's birthright. So Jacob shows up and he um, comes to Laban's land and he um, sees Laban's second born daughter, Rachel and falls in love with her, just wants, he wants to marry Rachel. And in the Bible, what it says in Genesis, Genesis 29 is that um, Leah was weak-eyed. Um, it's also translated as tender-eyed or uh, eyes that held no sparkle. And Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. So... I mean, that's what the Bible says, so it must be true, right? Um, so Leah was kind of forgettable. Rachel was obviously beautiful and popular and all those things. And so Jacob, of course, laid eyes on Rachel and was like, that's her. So he made a deal with Laban that he would work for seven years and um, then he would get to marry Rachel. And he did it. He worked hard. Um, he knew that he was going to get the prize at the end. And so when those seven years were up, he said, all right, give me Rachel as my wife. And Laban said, okay. Well, unbeknownst to Jacob, Laban had a different plan. And he took Leah and traded Leah out for Rachel and sent Leah in as Jacob's wife. And uh, when they woke up the next morning and Jacob saw that it was not Rachel, that it was Leah, of course, he was not happy. Um, you know, but Laban was like, well, you know, it's not really our custom to give away the second born daughter before the first born daughter. So have your bridal week with Leah and um, then I will give you Rachel. So a bridal week, um, it was custom back then that normally the bride and the groom wouldn't 
really know each other or have gotten to know each other before they got married. And so they would have this bridal week where for a whole week, it would, they would just be sequestered, the two of them, where they would get to know each other as man and wife. And so um, Jacob agreed to that. He said, okay, I'll do that. And then you'll give me Rachel. And so I'm thinking to myself, like, first of all, how would it feel to start a marriage based on a secret? Like you were the secret. How would it feel to start a relationship that was forced and that was a lie? It doesn't state whether Leah was a part, like it, it doesn't state anywhere in the Bible that Leah was like scheming or manipulative. Um, what it does state is that she wanted to be loved. And so it was more likely true that she did this out of obedience to her father, hoping that he would love her than, you know, her trying to get this guy. And, but what does that say about her identity? Maybe she felt not worthy. She definitely wasn't the first choice. Maybe she felt wrong and damaged, ugly. And she was definitely seeking love from the important men in her life. And what were those seven days like when you start your marriage and you're like, surprise. <laughs> and then you have to spend seven days with them. And like, you know, I don't, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that Jacob was a mean person. It doesn't say that he treated her badly, just indifferently. You know, she wasn't the one that he loved. So maybe she was feeling a little hopeful because I'm sure he treated her with respect. And maybe she was hopeful that she could earn his love. But also maybe she felt a little bit of dread because she knew after those seven days, her sister, the more beautiful one, was going to be thrown into the mix. And, you know, maybe she felt like, well, I'll just be the in insignificant one again. So Rachel was loved more by Jacob. And Leah was the one who God gave the children to. And she had several children. And with each one, she felt, well, maybe he'll love me this time. Her first son's name was Reuben, and it meant because the Lord has seen my misery. I don't know about you, but I don't want that name. Hi, my name's Reuben. The Lord has seen my mom's misery. <laughs> Simeon's not so much better because the Lord heard that I am not loved. And Levi... At last, my husband will become attached to me. Oh, I'd like to thank my daughter for these beautiful slides that she made. So after every birth, she hoped, okay, this time Jacob is going to realize how important I am and he is going to love me the most. And after every single birth, she was defeated because that is not what happened. After her, when she finally got pregnant the fourth time, the lights in her mind kind of started to flicker on. She realized, okay, maybe this isn't where it's at. And um, that living for the approval of her husband was making her pretty much miserable. When she had Judah, she named him, this time I will praise the Lord. So she started to see that maybe there was something else that could be better than what she was living for, what she was trying to get her identity out of, because it was all falling flat. Everything that she was trying to strive towards was not getting her any more happy or joyful or fulfilled. She was just sad and miserable and wanting. So, you know, as I kept reading the story, I was thinking, gosh, this is like crazy. Because, yes, that's great. Her lights, her, you know, things started to flicker, but then things got a little crazy again. So after she had Judah, she stopped having kids. Like she was not able to um, conceive. And so um, she decided, you know, it'd be really a good idea to give over her servant to Jacob. We've heard this story before. Like this is never something that is going to be blessed. But she did it anyways, thinking, well, if my servant can give him children, then, you know, I will be worthy and loved. 
That didn't help either. Then her son Reuben planted these things called mandrakes. And from what I understand, it's like it's a root vegetable that's much like a sweet potato, but it had like these mystical properties, right? And so um, they were supposed to help with like fertility and all these things. And so she's like, well, I'll do that. You know, that obviously is going to be blessed, right? Um, but before she could even have a chance to do that, her sister Rachel, who was also having the same struggles in fertility, said, hey, give me those mandrakes so that I can have children for Jacob. And I mean, I don't know what your response would be, but I'm, I'd be like, hey, you have everything. Really? Like you're going to take this too? Um, but Rachel was smart and she said, okay, fine. I will give you a night with our husband if you give me those mandrakes. And Leah was just so starved for love and attention that she said, sure, I would love that. The relationship between Leah and her sister is also something that I know a lot of women struggle with now. Um, even unintentionally, a lot of times sisters can be pitted against each other. When one parent gives another you know, one of the uh, sisters more attention or, um, you know, this child is good at academics. And so parents say, oh, my gosh, look at how amazing my daughter is at academics. And then the other sister's like, oh, well, I need to be good at something else. I don't think it's intentional, but it's there. And so this is also something that's playing into Leah's identity and who she is. And, you know, it's always not enough. Leah was older and had the birthright. She was the first wife of Jacob and she bore the children. Rachel was prettier and she still was more loved. And all of this makes you feel like not enough, right? Never enough. That's what happens when you focus on the world. So we can strive every day and this society wants us to, right? The world wants us to strive for what they think is important, but it's never gonna be enough. The thing I love about this story is that it uses people that are human and flawed. Jacob, you know, started off by taking his brother's birthright, and yet God still used him. Leah started off by deceiving her husband, and yet God still used her. Even in the worst times, because we are his children, he will choose and use us too. Before we were wives, before we were mothers, before we were sisters, we were daughters. And God loves us unconditionally, no matter what we do or what we strive for. He loves us because of who he made us to be. So wouldn't it be better if we figured out what our identity is in him? God chose us for a per he chose us for the purpose and the plan that he has on our life. And it says in Jeremiah 29:11, "For I know the plans I have for you," declares the Lord, "plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future." Throughout Leah's life, God was guiding her through her plan and purpose. Through her lineage, we have the tribes of Israel. And through her son Judah, we have Jesus. She had no idea. You know, all she could focus on was the fact that she wasn't loved by her husband. But God had such a big plan and purpose for her life. So what was the tipping point for her? When did she start to thrive in her purpose? It was when she recognized that her identity didn't come from man, it didn't come from herself, but it came from God. When the world was calling her alone, unwanted, second best, unloved, not blessed, God was calling her beloved daughter, chosen first, always with him, abundantly blessed like no other, honored and beautiful. But she had a choice. We all have a choice. We can choose to listen to the world and to the enemy 
and sit and look at those things that are not, or we can choose to listen to God and what he says about us. And if we believe that, that will directly correlate into how the rest of your life will play out. And it did with Leah. In the end, she was content with being loved by God. She focused on the giver of her blessings and not what was or wasn't being given. The world tells us that content means to limit yourself or settle. But in reality, it means accepting all that God has for you. Because being content in him is the opposite of being content in the world. If you can be content on what the Lord says about you, like think about that. Because he only sees good. He only has eyes that are love for you. So if you can stand in that and you can see the plan and purpose that he has for your life, content is amazing. So one last thought that I had, and it definitely redeems Jacob in my eyes, because, you know, Jacob to me just seems like a guy who is focused on one thing. I don't think that he even thought about Leah in like, you know, I think he was just apathetic towards her. But <laughs> this just shows me, one, that he finally kind of like had a light bulb moment, but also just how faithful God really is. So in Genesis 49, 29 through 31, it talks about Jacob's death. And it says, then he gave them instructions. I am about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave of the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Mac. Pila? <laughs> near Mamre in Canaan, which Abraham bought along with the field as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite. There Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried. And there I buried Leah. Leah was given the highest honor of, as first wife. In the end, Jacob acknowledged her place. He recognized her value, and he honored that. This honor was not given to Rachel, who he loved the most. We don't have to prove anything to anyone. By our own strength and our own thoughts, we cannot achieve anything of importance. We, got, we honor God and worship him by first accepting our identity in him and then going forth with the plan and purpose that he has for our lives. And we have to remind ourselves that this is a choice that we have. So if you're, if you're doing that, that is something that you can be proud of because it is very easy to give up. It is very easy to say this is, way, this is a way easier path. So that's something to think about. You have to choose it every day. Our minds are powerful tools. They can be used for the light or the dark. And it's our choice to look to others and compare what we have or don't have. Or we can look to God and focus on the giver. So in that, we can be content in knowing that God, the God of the universe, chooses us. Through the story of Leah, he was choosing us. Through Leah, he gave us a way out of all of our hopelessness, out of all of the comparison. He gave us a way to be with him forever. He gave us a way to right all the mistakes we foolishly made while living for the content of this world. He gave us Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for today. Um, we thank you for all the mothers and the women of this house. We thank you that um, they are life-giving 
And we just pray, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would just encounter them in a new way today, Lord, that they would feel honored and seen and loved by the Most High. And we just thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So now that we know where to find our identity, let's hear what happens when you step into that. Come on up, Vanessa. I feel tug of my blanket. It's still dark in my room. Another tug comes before I can fully gather my awareness of being awake. Another tug. I manage to pull an eyelid open just enough to see that it's my four-year-old at my bedside. As the weight of my eyes begin to get heavier again, another tug. I grasp in the dark for my phone. I peek at the time, 5 a.m. I roll over, another tug. I clear my throat. What is it, babe? He musters the best whisper he can and says, Mama, I made a mess. <sighs> I take a deep breath and sit up, not knowing what I will be facing with this mess. Okay, show me, I tell him. He walks me downstairs where a sea of Cheerios are scattered across the floor. The whole bag is empty and milk is all over the counter. My older two boys are now awake due to the sound of Cheerios being swept across the hard floor. The pounding from their feet is like a beating drum counting down the moments I have before having to be fully on my game. They run down the stairs to see there's only a little bit of Cheerios left. Bowls and spoons are now clanging along with cupboards, doors slamming. The few remaining Cheerios become the item of high value as fighting ensues. I finally get all the Cheerios swept up and take a breath to tell the boys to be quiet because the baby and daddy are still sleeping when I hear a faint cry. <sighs> Great, the baby's up. I guess my day really is starting now. I'm faced with a choice. Do I go upstairs to get ready and let the baby cry or do I go get the baby and try to get ready later? The anxiety level rising in me chooses the latter. Shoot, I forgot to clean up the spilled milk. I'll get to that later. I open the door to the baby's room and start singing our good morning song and open the blinds. A strong smell tells me that someone needs a diaper change. I swing him over to the changing table and begin to change him while enjoying his sweet smiles. My ears perk at the sound of whimpers coming from the doggy crate in my room. Oh man, the puppy's awake. <sighs> She's gonna wake up my husband if I don't hurry. I sweep up the baby and head over to my room to get the puppy out. With my baby in one arm and the puppy in the other, I head down the stairs. I'm greeted with my boys arguing with each other over which cartoon to watch. Seems like they figured out the Cheerio battle and they're on to the next one. I rattle off some repetitive family statement like focus on the solution, not the problem, or use your words. I let the puppy out and put the baby in his high chair. My seven-year-old approaches me very upset, wanting to tell me the play-by-play -play of the remote battles. And as much as I try to listen intently, the baby starts screaming, food, food, food. Just a second, let me get the baby a banana, I tell him. He knows the drill, so he just follows me and continues his story. I begin to reply to his story when the four-year-old bursts into tears because his nine-year-old brother just hit him with a pillow in his face. I shoot my most fierce laser eyes at my eldest and he responds, he was in my face. I give hugs to the little one and tell the eldest to be nice to his brothers and use his words instead of his body. Puppy wants back in. Okay, back to the seven-year-old. I ask him for some possible solutions to the situation. He just explained and he thinks up a few. The puppy is hungry for her breakfast. I begin to make her food when the baby throws the rest of his banana on the floor. Hurry, catch the puppy before she eats the banana. I place the puppy in her crate and give her breakfast. All right, boys, time to go. They rush around, get their backpacks and shoes on. I drop them off at school after kisses, sweet affirmations and hugs. I spend the entire drive home consoling my four-year-old who feels left out and wants to go to school too. We get back home and the aftermath of my boy's whirlwind begins to look like Mount Everest, an impossible feat. 
With my baby in my hands, my stomach growling, my eyes burning, the puppy, the puppy whining, and my four-year-old wiping away his final tears, I look at the cock that guides my life. It's 8.05 a.m. I know I'm not alone in the craziness of cult that we call motherhood. This story sounds all too familiar for many of us. It's hard balancing it all. All the tasks we face each day, the needs we meet, the checklists we create, the houses we maintain, the hearts we console, the hugs we give, it's never ending. A lot of this we do out of love, but it doesn't mean we don't get tired and weary of doing all these good things. I wrote this two years ago. I now have an 11, an 8, a 6, and a 3-year-old. But that's my life. I have four boys, all under 11, and um, it's a crazy life, and it's beautiful. But I do want to take a moment for any moms that have children under 10, if you would just stand so that we can honor you. You all are in the midst of the craziness. And so can we just give them a round of applause? It is a tough, tough job. Now I want all the mamas to stand, please. Because you all have been there. You all have gotten past that stage. You know that there's an end to the craziness. You know what's coming of the teenage years, and you know what's coming for some of the adult years, and you have endured. And so thank you for that, moms, for that blessing. So if we can give our moms a hand. Thank you. Proverbs 31, 31 says, honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gates. So thank you for everything that you do and pour into others. Women are so important. We represent a beautiful facet of who God is. Women were made in the image of God and we both show, the men and the women show different facets of who he is. In um, the story of Moses, as he's delivering everyone, we get to see the father God, the protector, you know, of all the plagues and the warrior. But then we get to see the mothering nature of God where he provides the manna and water. And so there's this part of him that is caring, comforting, and nurturing. There's a reason why we have Holy Spirit that's called the comforter. Women represent the creational role of God. We represent the sacrificial part of Jesus. We embrace the curse so that we may bring forth life as Christ embraced the curse so that we may have eternal life. Mothers embrace the curse so that a baby may be, re may be born as Christ embraced the curse so that we may be reborn. In every birth, the woman gives of herself and lays her body down in order to bring forth new life. She knows the pain and suffering she will endure, and yet she chooses life. She knows what's on the other side of the suffering, and she counts it as worth it. Mothers are a source of life to a newborn. They provide food, warmth, shelter, and comfort to a baby. Isaiah 66, 11 says, For you will nurse and be satisfied at her comforting breasts. You will drink deeply and delight in her overflowing abundance. The nursing mother represents God's abundant provision for all the nutrients the, body, the baby needs is in her body. Women represent God's unconditional love. My mother-in-law gave me this poem, and I want to read just a short excerpt of it. And it's talking about a mother's love. And it says, because she fell in love with you when you were just a thought, before she even met you, before you were a small baby who fit on her chest, and that kind of love loves unconditionally and powerfully. I personally had an amazing moment when I had my first son because I couldn't explain the unconditional love that I felt for him. It was different than my husband. I chose and I choose to love my husband every day. But this baby, I didn't know him. I didn't know his personality. I didn't know his flaws. I didn't know what he would become or who he was. But from the moment I saw the test, the positive test, I fell in love 
with this little life that was growing inside of me. And when he came forth, I just couldn't hold back tears. This thing that had been moving inside of me like this alien (laughs) was now here. And I was so in love and I realized what it meant that there's nothing you can do that would change how I feel about you right now. And even now he does stuff that tests me in so many ways. And I look at him and I go, babe, you know, I love you too much to allow this behavior to continue. The love is what guides everything and the choices that I make for him and all of my boys, because there's nothing they can do that could change that. So Jeremiah 1, 5 says he knew you as you, before he formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. And just as he knew you before your womb, your mother knew. The moms that are representing God's creational side, she knew you before you were even here. And there was love. So what does this all mean for the Rock of Roseville? Because really, mothers, women, we're only one half. This congregation of people in this house is in need of spiritual mothers. We're growing, people are coming, they're giving their lives to Christ, and that's what we want. But we need fathers and mothers. You don't need to be a physical mother in order to be a spiritual mother. In order to be a spiritual mother, you just need to be a woman who was created in God's image. And there's no age requirement. So young girls, you're spiritual moms too. So what does it look like? I just want you, I'm going to read this little story. I want you just to imagine this, okay? If you need to close your eyes, go ahead. If not, just stare at me, read. Stare at me while I'm reading. It's a bright, sunny day, and you pull up to this beautiful little house. You get out of your car, and your eyes get drawn to the beautifully manicured lawn with bright, cheery flowers in the garden bed. You walk up the cement walkway and approach the door. Below the door is a mat that says, Welcome. There's a bright green wreath with yellow flowers on a blue front door. You ring the bell. Within a few seconds, the door opens, and you are washed over by the smell of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies and by the woman of the house. She is smiling ear to ear and she looks so happy to see you. She says, welcome, I'm so happy you're here. Please come in and make yourself comfortable. You're captivated by her excitement to see you. You walk in and look around. She shows you to the couch where she already has iced lemonade waiting for you. You sit down on the linen couch that is so comfortable you could imagine taking the best nap on it. You take a sip of lemonade. She brings over a plate with those chocolate chip cookies you smelled earlier. She gives you a plate and napkin and you dig in. She asks you how your day has been and you begin to tell her the story from beginning to end. The entire time you are amazed at how attentive she is to your every word. It's like she really cares about the minute details of your day. She asks you open-ended questions that makes you feel seen and heard. It's like she's genuinely curious about the intricacies of your heart. Your time with her has finally come to an end after many delicious cookies and refills of the best lemonade you've ever had. The sun is still shining. You get up from the couch feeling relieved, relaxed, and rejuvenated. She walks you to the door, gives you a big hug that seems long, yet very much invited. She says to you, until next time, I look forward to seeing you again. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You get back into your car and you notice how you're feeling. When you were in her house, you felt peace, like time stood still and everything else could wait. You felt covered. You felt like she was someone who really wanted to hear your heart. You felt like you were loved by her. You didn't feel rushed or overlooked. She catered to you, which felt nice to be served. You loved the conversation because she didn't take over, but rather asked questions and even helped you solve a few problems just by her asking the right questions. 
All you know is that you cannot wait for your next visit. To me, this is the picture of the caring nurture of a mother. So, what if the women of the rock became spiritual mothers to all who entered this building? And this building was that little yellow house. What if we took care of the feeling that people get when they walk in? The flowers help with that. But what about handing them out as people come in? What if we spoke to each other by asking questions out of curiosity, of finding out who the person is that you're conversing with? What if you went out of your way to make others feel welcomed in your presence? You see trash in the parking lot. Pick it up. This is your house. What if you never spoke negatively to others, but instead positively? What if you gave hugs when you saw that someone needed one? What if you began to take care of the wounded? What if you offer someone coffee from the lobby when you saw them? If you enjoy baking, what if you brought brownies or cookies and gave them to someone random? If you enjoy scripture, what if you wrote down your favorite scripture and just passed that out? What if you pick someone out this week and then you find them next week and you let them know that you've been praying for them in the past week? All of these things are free. All of these things are from your heart. It doesn't take much to be a spiritual mom. I think sometimes we think about it and we're like, we got to find someone younger than us and we got to take them out to coffee and we got to like uh, invite them over to our house. And, it's, and it seems like this huge thing. It's like, for me, I already got four kids. I don't need more. <laughs> So, but it doesn't take much. It really doesn't for a woman to show her nurturing character of the nurturing character of God to say, I see you. I'm praying for you. How can I love on you right now? If you like writing, then write a letter that is edifying, loving, and uplifting to someone in the church. We are so in need of this. Every single woman in here, you are needed. Because the Lord is asking us to stand in the gap for people that don't have moms that know what it is to be a godly mother, what it means to love your children unconditionally. So many of us don't have that. And so we stand in the gap. That's our role. That's our job. To represent God well in the nurturing character of who he is. So here's what I heard the Lord say when I asked him what he wanted to say to mothers in our church. He said, I am calling them to rise. It is time for them to stand alongside the men and the fathers to create an equal union and picture of who I am. The two of them together represent me in every way. All my facets can be demonstrated through the union of a father and a mother. So at this time, I'd love to ask all the women to stand so that we can pray over you. Whether you have had physical children or not, you were designed to know what it means to carry something, to carry a promise and see it come forward and be birthed. You were meant to carry something that Holy Spirit would give to you and you would nurture it until you saw it come to fruition. That is something that a woman only knows, that patient waiting the patient waiting. There is calls on every single one of your lives. And you have patiently waited as you're seeing something grow. And sometimes it doesn't seem as it's growing as fast as you want it to. And some, I feel so strongly, you are in the birthing moment right now where it's hard and you're pushing. 
and it's painful. But know that the promise on the other side is so worth it. It is so worth it. It's worth the wait. It's worth the pain. And for you that are just having the seed of hope and what it is that you have to carry forward, we just speak to that dream and say, come on, grow, continue, push forward. So Lord, I just bless all of these women, these women that you created in your image, Lord. They are so incredibly important. Every single one, whether they count themselves as nurturing or not, they have gifts. The fiery women are important. The nurturing women are important. The compassionate ones are important. The quiet ones are important. The loud, crazy ones are important. I'm one of those. Every single one of these women are so incredibly important. So Lord, I pray right now that we would break, just in the name of Jesus, I break off any comparison right now in Jesus' name. This massive spirit that's over our culture of comparison, we just break that off of our church right now in Jesus' name. Guess what? Being a woman is hard, period. I don't care how good you make it look. It's hard. Lord, I just break off any generational curses over mothering. That that doesn't have to continue. You have full right to make it look new in the way that the, the Lord wants you to mother. Whether that's your own children or the people around you, you have the right in the name of Jesus to make it look how Holy Spirit wants it to look and how Holy Spirit wants it to come from you. And it's going to look different. Lord, we thank you that every single person in here is a daughter That is their inheritance. The Lord chose you to be a woman. We have a culture right now, and I have personally been asked this question from someone who wasn't sure if they wanted to remain a woman. And she looked at me and said, what's so great about being a woman? And this was probably five years ago. And man, did that stump me. Because I never really thought about it. It just kind of was like, it is what it is. But we have a generation right now that's really questioning. And we need to know why it is so important to be a woman. Because we do, we represent a very specific part of the Lord. We have been called to bring forth life. That is not a curse. And so many women see it that way. But we have the opportunity to have laid down our life and through that get to experience what humility is because you could have worked, like Sean mentioned earlier, you could have worked as hard as you could, but guess what? Your body changed. And that is part of the blessing. We get to experience what it's like to lay our life down. For 10 years, I just kept having babies. <laughs> For a decade of my life, every two and a half years, there's another one. All my plans got put on hold for 10 years, and I would do it again because I have children, I have boys that I love. We get to do that. 
we get to raise up a next generation. We get to make people feel loved, seen, and heard. That's what we do as women. We have tendering sides of us where it's tender-hearted and nurturing. That's who we've been created to be. And so, Lord, I just bless these women that they would begin to know who they are in you, that they would explore the, the kind of woman that you have asked them to be. Lord, I pray an anointing over them to start mothering people in this church, in the community, that they would hug people when they see that they need hugs, that they would see kids and, see and, and help them, that they would see mothers struggling and they would have no hesitation of just helping Take them into the car because you know what that's like and you've been there. No more second guessing. This is family and we say it over and over again. Start acting like it. You don't need permission to be loving. You don't need permission to be caring. So thank you, Lord, for these beautiful women who stand here and are so incredibly beautiful. I know it's a long time standing. But I'm doing this because you are standing in the gap. And sometimes it gets a little tiring. But look at all the women around you. This is our family. These are all the mothers of the house right here. Thank you for standing in the gap. I look forward to mothering alongside you. I bless all these women in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>